difficulties at the minute. So hoping that you can hear us. Um, I don't know if you guys put like a thumbs up or something, if you can, because we've had a bit of trouble with our, our computer this morning. So hopefully it's working okay. Um, just if you guys can hear me, is there any way you could uh, just put a comment or just thumbs up or something? That'd be great. We have the uh, chat open there. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes if there's any other one else, anybody else to come in. So we could just hang fire. Oh, really? oh, good. Yeah, we can hear the great stuff. Everyone's having a nice Easter. Great. Well, let's, uh, what will, so what we're here for today is, well, I'll introduce myself. So I'm, my name's Greg. Um, I'm the team lead for the Rhonda Shine School in Ridge team. And this is? I'm Sean. I'm part of the Bridge Ends team and one of the emotional wellbeing practitioners. So we're here today to do managing some exam stress. Um, we've, we know, especially around this time, exam stress where everyone starts to creep in, um, especially for parents, is sometimes quite a tricky, difficult period of time. So just giving some low level support, some strategies, um, you know, help that might uh, have a positive impact for our young people. Uh, and we've got a bit of a slideshow, um, which we'll go through. We've got a little video, so it's not gonna be hours upon hours. Um, so I'll just give you some quick housekeeping rules, if that's okay. Just let you know that all our training here is recorded. Um, if you could just keep your mic on mute throughout, that'd be great. Um, at the end, we'll do a bit of question and answers. And if anything you want to know, uh, let, let us know. Um, you can keep your cameras on, off, it's up to you. Um, and yeah, just be respectful of other people, really. So a bit of the objectives that we want to get out of this today is kind of what is stress? Uh, the causes of stress and some coping skills. So, what is stress? So, we can define stress by our body's response to pressure. Many different situations or life events cause stress. Stress is often triggered when we experience something new, unexpected, or threat. Our senses of self of when we feel we have little control over a situation. We deal with stress differently and our ability to cope can depend on our genetics, early life events, personality, social, economic circumstances. So stress is like alerting us to danger. Um, what we find is a lot of stress is almost perceived. Um, so, okay, we've always got the, the, the normal stress levels. Um, what we've got to make sure that we're in control of is when our perceived threat gets a little bit out of hand and we can kind of rein it back a bit and go, well, actually, my alarm system is alerting me, but do I need to be... Um, you know, full-blown panic stress mode. So, throughout our stress, we know that there's three types of um, scenarios that happen. So it's the flight, fight, or freeze. Um, the little kind of uh, cartoon on the top left, which kind of gives a bit of an idea of how we all fit into. Um, these are kind of predisposed into us. Um, they're kind of our evolutionary systems really and kind of why we're the, the top of the food chain as it were because we've got great we've got a great system for alerting us to danger hence why we've got these three amazing attributes unfortunately they can be quite scary they can almost overwhelm our young people um, myself working in um, therapies and managed to support young people found it quite powerful to actually explain what the fight flight and freeze um reactions are um, which sounds obvious because we all we've heard the phrase um but actually breaking it down to actually delivering it to someone and saying well actually you're going into a bit of a fight mode you're going into flight and freeze and it's quite empowering to understand that this is actually alerting you to danger because think about it these are alerting you to a perceived danger so somewhere when your stress or anxiety go through the roof your alert system is firing on all cylinders going right let's get ready and sometimes it doesn't need to be. But unfortunately, we pay a lot of attention to them. So I, I find it quite important to get, get somebody to understand what they're there for, why they act like they do, and almost, which doesn't sound the nicest of things, to say they don't go away, because they're very much there, part of us, um, 
to, to help support us from the dangers of life, as it were. What I try to get our young people to do is not pay so much attention that you get absorbed into it, or the opposite, where you're constantly pushing it away, and it almost acts like a bit like a ball in the water. The more you push it down, the more it comes back at you. So it's kind of good to know the, the, the differences, whether you kind of pay a lot of attention to these or you try to push them away. We've got a brief little video, um, which I can, we'll have at the end as well for you to, to put it on your phones or send to your young people. We're going to play it now. It's, uh, it's only, I think it's about three and a half minutes long. Um, great little, gives you a little bit of an understanding of uh, what I'm talking about, really. So... Should be playing now. Should be already copied, I believe, Shape, when I paste it into YouTube. Um, Will that mess up the sharing screen up? What do we at the end of the screen? We'll pop it in. We'll just say, be mindful of it. doesn't always work. Okay, so I don't know if you guys, um, hopefully you could get part of that video. What we will do is put that link um, up on the chat and if anybody wants it, we're more than happy to send it to you. Um, because this is a beautiful NHS building, our la our um, technology isn't always the greatest. So you may, may not have heard some of the audio or it might have been a bit glitchy. So like I said, re just so I repeat myself, I will put the link in there. It's a great kind of way of showing the um, uh, fight, flight and freeze in a different type of view. Some people like to learn um, 
by videos. I love YouTube videos for this because I find it really helpful. I think young people tend to absorb a little bit more sometimes from these this approach. Um, and again, you know, this just highlights the, the importance of why we have this. And also, I suppose, supports you as a parent, you know, when you think your child's going to potentially faint, you know, from a nursing perspective, it probably won't, um, because it's almost a, an opposite effect. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different reasons why um, um, these happen. A lot of our young people, we I tend to find get stuck with um, replaying things over and over again. So for example, um, again, this is predisposed into us. So for example, if I took myself in a time machine, went back 100,000 years and I survived a big air attack or a saber to tiger, a dinosaur, whatever, it's helpful for me to replay that memory over and over to my uh, colleague next to me. So he doesn't get attacked by the bear or he'll know what to do. Um, unfortunately, our young people today replay memories over and over again. So it's just about making somebody aware of what they're doing before they get so kind of entrenched with these negative thinking patterns. Um, with Shine, we do a lot of support and help around thought traps, thinking patterns. So again, you know, it's this is quite a lot to compress in, but if you find your uh, young person gets stuck on really negative thinking patterns or they predict the future, it always tends to be the worst, um, you know, we're always helpful to try and uh, use different approaches or ways to distract. So. Coming on to stress, lots of different causes throughout life, um, change, pressures, challenges, I think we can all kind of probably relate to them. Um, I suppose give yourself 10 seconds now just to think what causes you the biggest stress. And I would argue most of our perceived stress is not in our hands. Um, and that sounds quite scary, but I suppose understanding that if we notice that it is out of our hands, then we can then stop it letting affect in us. And we can do that by that simple logical thinking of going, well, I'm putting a lot of value into other people here. Take control myself and actually see what I can do about my own thoughts around it. Um, so there's quite a few things there. I mean, some of these would be um, quite relevant. So we're, we're focusing on exam stress. And what we tend to find is the change. So obviously a huge change um, if people pass or fail. The challenge itself, oh, I actually have to do something, achieve. We're in a very pass and fail society. So that underlying pressure is almost there. So for me, I always, uh, I've got children myself and you can be successful in so many other ways. And I think just, you know, having that grounding and validating to a young person is so helpful because we put a lot of pressure um, on passing exams. Um, and sometimes, even though arguably we can always say to our young people, oh, it doesn't matter if you fail, um, it sometimes gets dismissed. But it's about trying to validate that person. I like the coin in the, the, the lingo of try to validate, not agree. Um, it sounds interesting. What I mean by that is, you know, whenever you validate someone, you're almost getting them to be empowered. You know, you don't want to agree with them because sometimes you'll fall into their negative narrative or their, their negative viewpoint, um, which is kind of what we don't want. We want to just go, OK, look, I get what you're saying, validating. However, and then use other options then. OK, I'm going to pass you on to Shay for the next part. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so. If we're, if we're having a look at uh, the screen, that's the right one. So this is kind of um, a way of helping you to maybe empathize with what young people are going through, because um, it's one thing to understand you know, that they're going through exam stress and you want to support them. But the more you can understand exactly what they're going through, then the more effectively you'd be able to do that. So for, again, young people are not um, a single model. There's a massive variation in their experiences and the way they approach the things and the way they feel. So here are some of the more common ones and your young person that you're trying to support may have some of these, they might have all of them. Um, in some cases, they might have none of these. You know, you might have a particularly atypical or very different child who is stressed and is not showing any of these signs. So it's not um, it's not simply a tick box to find out what you know to to know uh, what if your child's struggling with um, with anxiety. But it's worth just maybe having conversations with them. But these are really good shorthand. You know, if you are noticing that your young person has a, a racing a racing mind, 
And again, that means that they're, you know, just like Greg was saying, they're stuck in certain thought patterns. They can't seem to get off this merry-go-round of, you know, a particular thought, usually negative thoughts, um, and all the wrong things or terrible things that might happen. Um, possible sleep disturbance, which again is difficult to kind of, you know, notice or isolate with teens, especially. Um, you know, are they sleep disturbed or are they just being teenagers and not wanting to go to bed? Um, feelings of breathlessness, and again, uh, you know, all, all we would always say don't discount physical reasons. So, you know, if you've dis if you've worked out that the child doesn't have asthma, that there's not a cold, there aren't any illnesses, and they're still struggling with their breathing, you know, faster, shorter breaths, then that might be a sign that they're you know, stressed. Um, they could feel sick. There may be a lack of appetite. And again, you're look, looking past, um, you're looking for, right, is there a physical reason here? No, all right, you haven't eaten any, none of us have got food poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so could this be related to stress? Um, are they restless? Uh, do they feel like their legs are a bit jelly and a bit sort of shaky on their legs? Um, do they seem to be dizzy or disorientated, like headed? Uh, blurred vision is another classic one. Um, difficulty in swallowing, which is something you can sometimes see in them. Um, heart racing, they've got palpitations. Uh, maybe they're shaking a lot. They might be sweating or shivering, or they might have that. And again, it, it may, all of that sort of might pile itself into that uh, fight, flight, or freeze response into the flight one, wanting to run away. You can see them ready to try and escape from the situation. Um, so again, it's, you know, we want to be empathetic and sympathetic to what a young person is going through. And, and you know, if you can imagine from a perspective of a young person who maybe hasn't identified that they're, you know, they know that they're not happy about the stress levels they've got, but they don't have the knowledge that you do. They don't have the perspective of an adult. So this is all new to them. Remember, young people are learning everything. Uh, so some of them experiencing this for the first time. So, you know, if they're kind of having this restless feeling or, you know, maybe their mind is racing, unlike, you know, as, I don't struggle with this as well, but for them, this is the first time they've experienced this, so it's incredibly frightening, especially if they don't know why. And and if you look at those, Shay, sorry, yeah, just uh, that's right. If yeah. we look at them, and we can all pick one or two which we have now. What I try to do, and and we do here in Shine, is to try to actually give and empower someone the rationale behind these, because these are terrifying. Look, I mean, you know, feeling jelly-like legs, wanting to run, heart racing. You know, the reason they're so powerful is because it's alerting you to this perceived danger. Mm -hmm. Now, like Shay said, is our young people are learning. Now, we might actually now know what these are for. So I'm going to just see if any of you know, and these are about survival. All of these predetermined instincts here are making us survive. So exa for example, jelly-like legs. How does that make me survive? You know, think about it logically. How does me having a jelly leg what make me want to uh, escape? Well, that's actually adrenaline going to your legs. That's what that feeling is. Trembling, um, difficulty swallowing, heart racing. Your heart races because it's pumping blood to your muscles, getting you ready for fight or flight. Um, the, the, the vision, think about it. If you're in a fight or flight mode, you want your vision to be sharp and attuned to the danger. You blur out the rest. Um, sometimes people get hypersensitive with their hearing because they want to hear the danger. So all these, seem terrifying but for me giving simple explanations to someone sitting them down and going okay well explain to me how do you know you're stressed what's your body doing sorry she i've just jumped on it's always nice for me as uh, working with young people is what's the most overwhelming is it their thoughts racing or these physical sensations and guess what we can explain them which also empowers and helps no, absolutely and I, I agree with everything you said one of the best things you can do for the young people it's not so much a about taking the stress away from them and that's that's actually not a good thing at all this allowing them to understand why they're stressed so they're yeah. able to be for them to be able to put into context and to realize that they're not weird they're not freaks this is not a unique thing to them and it's just part of being human and also like everything else like every other motion um, or you know sensation it's going to last for a defined period it's not going to last forever. And that gives them hope. So you know, one of the terrifying things for a young person might be that I feel this way. How do I know when it's going to end? Yeah. Is it going to end? Am I always going to feel like this? And you know, the answer is, well, no, it's not going to last forever. But we can do some things to make it shorter. And we can do some things to make it not as intense. But the feelings you have, they are there for a reason. And that's, again, what Greg was saying in terms of validating as well. So not just validating them in terms of their feelings, but also validating them to know that 
this is a human condition like this is you are part of the human race this is not a weird thing mm -hmm. um yeah so and, and actually you know like yeah. we said we're, we're trying not to make them think that stress is a terrible thing it's it is part of the human condition and again remember validates without agreeing so we we validate that they feel stressed we validate that what we don't want to do is say don't worry about stress it's fine mm -hmm. you know and again because sometimes we might jump to this which is the benefits of stress i'm going to talk about the benefits of stress but with a caveat and with a warning that before you talk about the benefits of stress you need to validate them and show them that you understand because what a young person is doing if they're if you're fortunate enough to be trusted by your young person and they're coming to you saying i am really stressed you know, maybe they've noticed it and you want to talk to them but if they've actually come to you and said i'm really stressed i'm really worried about my exam etc cetera, etc cetera, um that actually takes a lot for them to admit that they're afraid and they're worried especially at that time of life you know when they're sort of in, in their teen years so what they need first is to know that you've heard them and that you are accepting what they're saying now, if you were to say, if the, you know, young, imagine a situation, a young person comes to you and says, ah, Mom, Dad, Sir, Miss, I'm really, really stressed about these exams. And your immediate response is, Listen, mate, there are some benefits to stress. All right. It's going to motivate you to work harder and succeed, which is true. It can enhance your resilience and problem solving skills, which is also true. Um, healthy amounts of stress will help you build relationships, which are essential to your health, which is also true. And a lot of low-level stress actually stimulates production of certain brain chemicals, which can strengthen the connections in the brain, which is why when you study under stress, you're more likely to kind of remember it in the short term anyway. And this boosts productivity and concentration. All of those things are true. But what your young person might hear is, yeah, your stress doesn't matter. I'm going to give you reasons why your stress doesn't matter. So you want them to actually listen to the benefits of stress, but if you want them to listen, you have to listen to them first. So validate what they're saying. Oh, tell me how you feel. You're stressed. Do you know the reason why? And again, it's, sometimes it's hard to listen without immediately jumping in with a solution. You know, if someone comes to you and says, I'm bleeding, your immediate response is, well, let's clean it up and wash it off and then bandage it then. What do you mean? What do you mean? You, there's an obvious solution. Um, and emotions are not as simple as that. So but it, you know, if you think of it almost like a triage thing, before you can fix the wound, you kind of have to clean it. And the cleaning would be the validation. So they come to you, you validate them, you give them the opportunity to feel like they've been listened to. And once they feel like they've been listened to, then they are more willing and more able to listen to what you're saying. Uh, and also it's, it's a stress reliever as well. Because mm -hmm. one of the biggest, when, when we talk about how to cope with stress, one of the biggest things is talk to someone about the problems. Um, and if you're talking to someone, you're almost sharing the issue. If it feels like they're listening, then there's almost like a, a bit of joint regulation happening. And the whole situation starts, it maybe not is solved, but you start to calm down about it. You start to feel better about it. You start to feel that someone else understands where you're coming from. And that's where the young people would be. And jumping straight on to there, actually, mm. that leads me into what I think is like exactly what you've said, Chase, to try and understand what the problem is before the solution. Mm. Because your solution could be on the left hand and their solution is on the right hand. So first of all, they're stressed. Now, they come to you for help. And not only are they stressed, you've now given them a solution which doesn't fit their solution. Now, they are doubly stressed because they've come to you to help. And the solution you've given them is miles apart. So it's really interesting for me to just try to pause, give a bit of context and understand that problem before we start jumping to solutions. It's very hard, by the way, because even as a nurse, as practitioners, as parents, we want to alleviate um, distress and jump to a solution, which always seems to be the great answer. And, th and then we sit and think, I've given the best answer on earth. Why doesn't this work? Well, it's probably because it's not their solution. <laughs> that simple. But understanding that's really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so we've talked about the benefits of stress. Um, and so hopefully, you know, again, understand, just to quickly summarize, uh, try and make sure that you empathize and understand what the young person may be going through. Um, being aware of the benefits of stress, but making sure that you validate them before you talk to them about what the benefits are. Um, and these are some of the coping strategies that you can share with uh, the young people, you know, and again, at the point where they're ready to listen. So again, just remember, validate first to make sure they're in a position, they feel supported, and then you can start sharing some of the solutions that we we're talking about. And also, remember, like Greg was saying, your, your immediate choice of solution 
might be great for you and it works for you. It might not be great for them. It doesn't mean that your solution is a bad solution and it doesn't make you a bad parent or adult or teacher or whatever for suggesting it just may not suit them. Um, a nice uh, analogy someone gave me was of um, pairs of shoes. You know, someone comes to you and says, I want to play basketball and you've only got size eight trainers. So you offer them to them, but this kid has size 16 feet. You've given them the best solution you had. It just doesn't fit this kid's feet. Mm -hmm. You're not a failure and it's not your fault that your shoes are too small. So that's one way of thinking about it and mm -hmm. maybe depersonalizing it. So your solution isn't about you. It's just trying to find the right one that fits them. So we've got this idea of problem solving. Um, and again, this is more about preparation. So it's, it's a really good one to think about ahead of time. So preparation, we know the signs of stress and we have certain things ready. So exams are coming up. They know they are going to be stressed. Actually, we say that. Do they know they're going to be stressed? Because again, it seems logical to us. If you've got an exam coming up, surely you're going to be stressed about it. So something's going to happen. But again, they're kids. Um, if we're talking about GCSEs, this is the first time that they have this type of exam for some of them that's going to be, you know, that's, see, I'm, okay, actually, I suppose some of them are taking their exams in year nine now. Mm. Um, but again, even with the year nine exams, they do that with the caveat knowing that if they quote unquote fail, they get okay. a second chance, yeah. you know, in year 10, a third chance in year 11. So for some of them, maybe if they've maybe fail, quote unquote failed, they didn't get the mark they wanted, year nine, year 10. Year 11 is their last in their heads. This is their last chance. That can be quite stressful. Yeah. So we want it. So we know the signs of stress. We have things ready. And here's something we encourage. We don't order. So encourage young people to have a space for study and a space for relaxation and try and make sure those two spaces aren't the same. Again, space is at a premium for some families. So that this has to be in a, a logical way. If, if we're sharing a bedroom, that's maybe isn't, you know, the greatest sort of situation to you know start putting bound those kind of boundaries in place but are there spaces around the home or even in the environment the wider neighborhood you know so if they're studying at home when they go to nanograms can they just relax there you know that's their relaxation space so they study at home and then when they go to nans for the weekend there's no there's no work there's no homework you know that's that's the kind of thing we're thinking the logical ways to kind of separate the source of their stress which is going to be the work and a time for relaxation, which is absolutely necessary for them to be able to absorb the information and for them to be able to you know, function more optimally. Um, preparing a common activity to use before and after the stressful situation. And sometimes helpful to think about um, you know, top performing athletes, to think of some of the rituals they use before they go into you know, whatever it is, like your 100 meter sprinters, um, your boxers, your rugby players, if you watch them on, on TV, they all have these little uh, rituals, these superstitions that they go through before they perform. So this is something that is an activity, a common activity, settles them, it grounds them. Um, and it's a good one to share with young people, you know, and just finding something that works for them. Um, so there's the preparation aspect. And then there's the acceptance aspect, you know, and it's, it's not about... Um, getting them ready for failure or giving up on, on, on anything. But it's acceptance that, number one, we can't avoid doing things that make us stress because life is stressful. We cannot avoid stress. Um, then also, we should be on the next bullet point, uh, a little bit of typo there, but knowing the signs of stress and having things ready. And this is a more personalized issue because, like we said, all the young people are individuals. They're all very different. So my signs of stress might be very different different from Greg's mm. and I'd say even within the same family I've got two brothers our signs of showing stress are very very different and that's in the same household same parents everything else should everything else being equal we still have these very different reactions so uh, um, you know your young person will exhibit certain signs out of the ordinary which you might be able to latch on as ah oh, right that's a sign that they're stressed um, and also just getting normalizing stress that it is a part normal part of life um, it's our reactions that aren't so they are gonna be stressed, it is gonna happen, but you wanna give them as much support as possible to be able to cope. It's a big form of communication, isn't mm. it? You know, just think about it. Every time, you know, whatever they're saying in this um, environment where they're feeling stressed, just look at it, every single point is they're communicating a need, that there's a need that needs to be met there. That's how I, and it's not always quite as simple as that, but you know, when, for example, you know, when you you say, oh, it doesn't matter if you fail, and then you see them ramp up their anxiety around that very statement. Well, think about it. 
you know, think about what that's communicating to you. And, and just gives you that little bit of a, oh, okay, well, what actually are they communicating? They seem mm. quite distressed with that response. Mm. Um, it sounds quite robotic, but it's just about you <laughs> obviously do it, you know, in your own thoughts and go, well, actually, did that help? Why didn't that help? You know, and be inquisitive to, to the communication that's coming from your child or mm. uh, young person, because, um, again, it makes you a little bit more open to, to what the problem is, not your solution ready to fall into place. Mm. Yeah, I think it's you know it's, it's really it's really important to remember that um, what you know, their levels of stress are not necessarily yours, if, if that makes sense. And so when they're like Greg was saying, when they're communicating something and then you try and help them and it doesn't work, that might actually cause a little bit of stress in mm. you because you're trying to help them and whatever you're trying isn't working. So it's really hard sometimes. But it's important to remember and like Greg was saying, taking a step back from that and just being curious. Like if it's working, awesome, it's gonna calm you down. Give yourself a sort of mental high five. <laughs> brilliant. If it's not working, again, similar, similar to the advice you're trying to give your kids, rather than berating yourself and thinking like, why isn't this working? What's wrong with A, me, or B, the solution, or C, the child? It's just a case of taking a step back and thinking, all right, it didn't work. What else could I try? Or what does, you know, the thing that they seem to be getting even more stressed about, what does that tell me? And the example that Greg was given, you know, that a child is worried about their exams and you say, don't worry, you can, you know, don't, it's okay if you fail or you can try again next year, you know, and then they, they react really badly to that. And, you know, there are lots of things that that could be. It could be that you're reminding them that failure is an option, so that's why they panic. It could be that in their minds, when you say, oh, it doesn't matter if you fail, they might be thinking, oh, he thinks I'm going to fail, so he's just trying to make me feel better about it. And so there's all these different possibilities of ways they're looking at it that didn't even occur to you. Um, so yeah. Um, so next step is problem solving. Um, yeah, problem solving. So this is, and again, that first step is really important, allowing them time to de-stress. So don't jump immediately into problem solving mode. They need time to communicate what their distress is, to start to come down from that heightened fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, and also a, a quite interesting biological thing, as Greg was saying, these are things that we're evolutionary, evolutionarily programmed to do. Um, and when the amygdala takes over, re, uh, it genuinely does take over. So the higher functions in the brain disappear like your ability to think outside the box goes away and it's almost like your brain can only really think of those three solutions and whatever the solution looks like in that situation so it's not that people are you know, i don't know if you've had this experience um, where you've spoken to a child and they've behaved in a way that just didn't make sense you know they got really stressed out and they've you know they've uh, had a a, a massive um, explosion a temper whatever it is and you ask them well why did you do that and they stare at you blankly. And for some of them, it's a genuine thing. They cannot explain why. Because in the cold light of day, once they've calmed down, they can clearly see that that solution did not help. It didn't help to start shouting. It didn't help to, to kick their shoes off. None of that helped. So why did they do it? And for a child, that's really like, I don't know why I did that. Uh, and one of the things you can help them is, look, look, I can see you lost your temper. I can see you kind of went over the top there. If you were heightened, if this is what's happened, then your brain just narrows down. You know, it's a bit like when you're you're running. Um, that's what that's quite a good. If you're running at full speed, there's only so much information you can take in, and that's what's happening in the brain. There's only so much information they can take in, and there's only so many solutions they can come up with. They're either going to fight the problem, they're either going to freeze and hope it goes away, or they're going to run away from it. And in some rare, rare cases, they might try and eat the problem. Mm. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So give them time to de-stress so that, that so their higher functions take over. So again, that you know, amygdala brain at the base of the spine is kind of starting to calm down. And then the higher functions, you know, the front part of the brain, top part of the brain, they start to take over. And when they're in that space, then we can sit down more logically and say, right, what are the problems? Let's, let's list them down. And again, to just say anything they want, like what are all the problems you've got? And they can write them down. Okay, cool. We can't deal with every single one of these problems. Let's let's pick the top two and the top three. All right. So then they start to rate them. And if they start to rate them, then already you can start to see, right. So your problems have a hierarchy. So some prop your problems you feel are more important than the others. That again starts to help them to put things in perspective and context, which is part of what you're trying to teach them. So for all of those problems, then you start to think about what are the possible solutions. And this can be a quite a fun thing to do because you can say to them 
all possible solutions, including the really terrible ones, because then that validates them. It's like, you know, okay, so what is the problem? Oh, I'm really stressed about the exam. Okay, so what are the solutions? Let's run away and join the circus. Uh, let's go into school and punch the teacher in the face. Um, let's eat our... And, and as you're saying, these ridiculous possible solutions, mm -hmm. they'll be looking at you, hopefully laughing, or just, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, those are all solutions. They're not good ones, but they are solutions. And the fact that you didn't choose these terrible solutions means that your problem solving skills are actually pretty good, pretty good. And it's been defined by them. They yeah. are doing it. Even if you guys try, um, try to do this, think of two things that you're stressed about over the next uh, few days and actually do these four steps. And it's amazing how powerful it is, mm. especially getting them out of your head onto paper because mm. it makes you more proactive, which is um, what we want, really. Absolutely. Yeah, there's something about putting it on paper mm. as well that kind of you know makes it more official. Um, and also it sort of externalizes it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you've got your possible solutions, again, looking at the pros and cons of those solutions. So again, you know, it, almost like in this ridiculous situation, you go to school, all right, here's a solution, punch teacher in the face and steal the, uh, the, the answers. Pros, I've now got the answers. Con, I'm gonna get kicked out of school <laughs> and I can't take the exam anyway because I've now assaulted a teacher, possibly, you know, getting a criminal record. So you, again, you know, it's looking at things more objectively. So when they start to, so you start with these almost ridiculous solutions. And by the time you start to get to the more logical and realistic solutions, like, all right, so what's a possible solution to your exam stress? Study ahead of time, um, pros, be a bit more relaxed. You have the information in your head, um, less likely to stress about it. Cons, um, can't go to the park on that day. You know, it, it starts to make more sense to them. They're more likely to take that on board. And again, if you help them to arrive to these solutions and you really want to prompt them to say these solutions themselves, they're more likely to go through with it rather than something you're imposing on them. And, and adding to that, whilst this is a great tool, because what you'll find is that it might highlight the bias thinking. So if you find that every solution is failure, negative, catastrophizing, you've got a negative thinking trap straight away. So you can back chain it and go, well, actually, I've noticed you're thinking with the negative lens on. Um, what if we took that glasses off and changed it? It sounds so similar, but framing your language to highlight to someone, actually, you're thinking quite negatively there, mm -hmm. or not even you know so aggressive with the approach but just say look i'm wondering why they're all quite um catastrophizing mm. could we come up with uh, the opposite of that you know just be quite inquisitive playful as shay said you know with some of the examples because that will then lead their solutions come out a little bit more than that's defined in them so mm. and that's the squad that's that uh, purple lens yeah. example as well like if a child is having uh a, a, like we were saying a negative bias and so they find it difficult to see the positives and the solutions. It's a bit like having tinted glasses. So we've heard of rose tinted glasses. Mm. And those are like eternally optimistic people who always see the happiness in their situation. And you, you can also have the, the opposite, you know, these negative tinted glasses where every situation they can only really see the negative possibility. And that's what the step four is quite useful for because pros and cons, well, pros would be the positives. So can they actually articulate any positives? Um, if they really struggle to do that, then that tells you something that they are, are you know, very negatively biased. And it, you know, it's important that you, you know, you're supporting them, but you can also challenge them. You know, mm -hmm. um, stress doesn't mean you have to step softly all the time. You can actually politely challenge their point of view. Yeah, and also, you know, having that negative bias thinking pattern isn't always bad. Again, so don't make it a label of oh, you're thinking this way it's it's failing just go look i've noticed you're thinking like that what's the other side of that mm -hmm. simply just framed in a, in just that brief sentence it might activate somebody to think a little bit differently because it's so hard to get people to think like now if i all said don't think of an elephant think of an elephant so getting someone to not think is as hard <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right so here are some other things that can help and again you know these are available and um, have been shared with schools um, share them again. So basically, read the exercises, you know, they're ten a penny on the internet. You can have a look at YouTube videos to sort of, um, you know, talk you through some of these. They're really good ones to share. Balloon belly breathing is extremely good one as well for, um, uh, you know, if you've got young people who maybe are interested in the performing arts, you know, they're singers uh, or they're musicians, especially woodwind, then they'll be aware of diaphragmatic breathing, you know, breathe into the stomach, breathe in uh, the lungs down to sort of extend the diaphragm. So that's quite a useful one 
for them. You know, that it's, it has a context outside of stress and anxiety. Um, square breathing, you know, again, very straightforward. They just count, um, you know, for, count to four while they go around either an imaginary square or rectangle. Uh, um, and that this can be windows, and it's quite good for school, I think, square breathing. Well, because... even now, if you guys now spend 10 seconds just mm. looking your way wherever you are, there are squares everywhere. Yeah. From the screen to your phone to paper to the ceilings, doors, there's, there's squares everywhere. That's why it's a pretty, pretty good one. Yeah. What's the, what's the blanket term for squares? And quadrants? I'm, I'm thinking about the more neurodiverse, because if you say square, yeah. and that yeah. might trigger, like, but they're on the squares, they're on the rectangles, yeah. they're yeah. four sided. Four -sided what's it, quad yeah. Quadrilateral? Yeah. Well, yeah quadrilateral objects. Um, drums was quite a nice one as well. Imagine your breath uh, and uh, a hand sort of um, almost like you're beating it very, very slowly. So breathe to the beat. Um, and again, for those who are musically inclined or those who are more physical as well, this is quite a good one. Yeah. And then for young people who are, you know, in that kind of stressed, uh, you know, possibly fight, flight, or freeze mode, that's quite a good one to start doing. And we'd also encourage you to model these. So don't just explain them. Do them so the kids, so the young person can see you do it. And they're more likely to take on board what they see you do rather than what you tell them. And do it when they're calm. Don't yes. wait until they're <laughs> at the point of stress and then go like, we're going to try the exercise now. You know, yeah. It's always nicer to do it when you're in that um, calm mode. Yeah, absolutely and you're activating that memory as well so if you've done it when they were calm and then at the point of their stress you're saying remember the breathing we did it before yeah. then we'll like to be able to do that it links. absolutely um and then start again to be start could be any shape just using any shape that they like to control their breathing as soon as the angle changes breathe in ch angle changes again breathe out it could be anything like that um grounded techniques these are really it's basically a distraction technique and it's a great one for you know immediate stress um and you just get them to focus on their five senses um, and you can make it more personalized you might say to them look what's your favorite color and you know what their favorite color is and it's purple so okay. look around the room see if you can find five things that are purple and again you know it's really difficult to not think of something mm -hmm. so as soon as you said that even in the heightened state that they are it's very hard not <laughs> to sort of color purple oh, right you know they are going to start noticing um and especially if they get stuck on a cycle. I think, you know, a lot of our young people get stuck recycling. As I said earlier, you know, if there was a bear attack, I replay that. And a lot of our young people get stuck with these reoccurring um, replaying memories. So just get them to try to think of their next thought. Sounds quite obvious, but trust me, when you ask somebody, think of your next thought, it puts a bit of a break between what they're thinking and activating another thought. And it doesn't matter if it's the same one. If you just say, try to tell me what you're thinking of your next thought. Sounds really bizarre, but try it. It's a great one. It is. Yeah. So uh, yeah, five things they can see, um, four things they can touch, um, tell them that to be appropriate and you know, keep to themselves, hands to themselves. So, you know, the hair, shoes, clothes, etc. cetera. Um, get them to think about texture, you know, what can you feel? Is it rough? Is it smooth? And do you think it's heavy? Is it metallic? Is it hard? Is it cold? Uh, three things you can hear is great as well. You know, um, close your eyes, listen carefully. You can make it more specific and say, look, can you hear anything in your own body? Because some of them can actually hear, if they're mm -hmm. quite stressed, they can hear their own heartbeats. Mm -hmm. They might be able to hear their own breathing. Can you hear anything else in the room? They can hear maybe you. You can deliberately kind of scuff the table or something so they can hear that. And you can challenge them. So like really concentrate on your senses. Can you hear anything outside of the room? you know, birds outside, car, etc. So that, again, the focus so much that whatever is stressing them out or the thought that's causing them stress kind of goes, you know, temporarily away and helps them, you know, calm down. And then two things you can smell, you know, basically themselves and whatever's in the room. And one thing they can taste, you know, that some people have, will mm -hmm. have mints or something strong tasting with them. That's quite a good, that is quite a good, yeah, good, good distraction them. technique. Mm -hmm. um, finding a, you know, a, not necessarily sweet, but something with strong a strong, strong yes, yeah, mm -hmm. something strong tasting. Or well, something they like, you know, when, yeah. when someone's feeling really rubbish, have a lemon sherbet yeah. and yeah. describe it, you know, things like that. It's little tips and tools because, you know, these are quite low level, like yeah. you said, you know, they you know, they're just to try to just disrupt that real negative stress mm. um, response. Yeah, um, there's so many out there. Well, there's a, even there's an app called Calm Harm. It's a great app. There's lots of these kind of built into the app, as we all know, our young people love their phones. Um, so you know, 
that, that they can access them. There's also a minute countdown there, so they can you know apply this into a countdown setting. And yeah, there's lots of um, uh, lots of things. That's on Calm Harm, which is um, is free on uh, most of the app stores as well. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, six steps to manage stress. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah, how do we manage stress? I mean, there's lots of different steps. Um, like I said, we've kind of gone through quite a few. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's making it fit you, you know, every every household, every family has different ways. Um, these are just a couple of, um, I'm not going to go through them all, but as you can see, there's, there's, there's quite a few that give examples. Um, I think just be creative. I think is always the best one because another great one is animals. You know, if you've got um, a dog, when you're feeling rubbish, just grab your dog. It's, it's, you know, it's, we're really quick as adults. When we've all got headaches, we go to the cupboard and pick paracetamol up, take some water, and our pain will be relieved. Our mental um, pain doesn't seem to be seen quite as easy. Um, and little things like that is, is, is understanding that we've got our own little medicine cabinets in the back of our head. We've just got to start filling them in um so yeah if you love your dog go and grab your dog for about four minutes all you'll think about is your dog great that means your thought patterns have gone they've shifted they've changed um so there's a few little things on there um like I said, i'm not going to go through them all because um, i'm mindful of time as well um, so let me just go to the next slide if you don't mind that'd be great um being active connect and seeking help again we kind of i suppose we've gone over all these really you know in a roundabout way um oh, there's a dog walk there um kind of look at what our young people love doing um especially connecting i think what we find is and think about your own positions and self you know we're human beings we all like to connect i think so for me i look at that more logical what is it out of the connection that is actually helpful and i think it's been validated um which is, is just great because you know in work or with with peers you kind of bat your kind of um approach and then you kind of almost waiting to see oh is that acceptable <laughs> um so just be mindful that you know our young people kind of throw stuff at us you know they put, it tends to be more of a grenade type thing <laughs> so it's, it's not us throwing the grenade back going oh we don't want that you know it's about going oh great this is a grenade why does this why is this so scary um so you can help so like i said all of our shine practitioners are in the schools um Schools are going for quite a tricky time at the minute. And um, like I said, we're coming from a health perspective and trying to see the both, uh, you know, viewpoints. We understand uh, parents are putting so much effort and energy in as well. Um, like I said, so, you know, if there's anything here you want a little bit more on or some more um, support. Oh, sorry. So we've got like resources. Again, I can't see my camera, so I don't know if this is coming on there. Let me switch, um, let me switch that and see. If can... I'm just going to go through a couple. Um, so there's like... Uh, let's see if we can get this to go so yeah so we've got like all sorts of resources these are all available to schools um so if you want them to say school can we have some of the shine resources and we're like i said we're here to try and help them uh, um, ah, great let's try again so here we go there's like these like resources here there's one for taking care of me we've got so many resources and what we also know is there's so many third sectors out there which not everyone knows about. And again, with us being at the kind of arrowhead, you know, um, we're, we're pretty on the ball with uh, keeping up to date with some of these. Um, so again, you know, if you want any questions, we are in all the schools. So I think what we'll do, we'll bring this to a close now because um, we've talked quite a lot. Um, and I think, thank you ever so much for everybody uh, engaging and listening. Um, we're happy to stay on here for the next few minutes if anybody wants any questions put them in the chat or if there's anything else like i said there's a shine practitioner in all our young people's schools um just make the school aware if you want anything or if you want some further support yeah please uh, anything you want just um just let us know so i hope i hope you got something from there there's a lot to compress um because you know the comp we're dealing with people there's complexities and different narratives on all angles so hopefully that has supported and covered a little bit um but yeah any questions pop them in the chat That'd be great. Crazy how long the uncomfortable silence can last as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> that might cause some anxiety as well. Um, it's a good path. Therapy, the silence. Yeah. Hard for me.
Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, yeah, we, let, me, let me do that right now. Um, okay. There you go. Hang on, Chase. Go forward on that again. Oops, let me go off. Yep. We got a YouTube advert playing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there we go. That um, should be in the chat now. <laughs> no, that's definitely not the right one. That's a remortgage in there. No, we'll have to that. Bear we'll, with us. We'll, we'll get the link and yeah. um, it's like, here we go. There we go. Let's try again. Here we go. Share. Copy. There um, we go. There we go. That is sneakily trying to get us to sell you some mortgage um, and financial advice, which we're not going to do. Also, there's a there's another great video. Um, if you go onto YouTube and put in The Happiness Trap by Dr. Russ Howard, I believe. Very good video as well. It's only three minutes long, and it gives a very good understanding of what um, the complexities of life and how we're simple things, and it can get quite overwhelming. Really good video. And the sushi train for the same guy. Still <laughs> <laughs> differently. I like weird video shit. Right? I, you know, <laughs> honestly, if YouTube had been around without Yeah, that, no, I agree. You know, as much as we complain about the use of technology, there are some great resources yeah. out there. It's just a case for some time directing our young people and ourselves to accessing more positive things and you know, do the scrolling. Mm. Yeah. Um, still like Oh, there's lots of that. Yeah. yeah. Any any other questions or any kind of concerns? Is there anything else sort of um, in particular that might be worrying you about? Or interests? Or interests yeah. you know, in terms of you know, supporting young people, um, or maybe ways of approaching. Yeah. Um, probably one of the things that you know before moving into this role, um, I was a teacher for 15 years, and I know that in secondary. In the last six years of my teaching career, so that was probably from, from 97 onwards, um, there was a process of uh, a policy of intervention. So when children were at uh, you know, maybe the mock exams or even earlier, then there'd be a process of giving them extra lessons. Uh, and again, not a, not a problem to you know, support young people and to give them extra help and to give them extra you know um, support in achieving their their goals but what tended to happen you know and then this is with the benefit of hindsight you know i didn't realize at the time what tended to happen is that um this actually had quite a dampening effect because when these young people were coming these were not necessarily quote unquote badly behaved so they'd done everything they were supposed to do they just weren't quite achieving what they needed to um and from their perspective it seemed like they were being now punished for not being smart enough. So they come in in the morning and instead of mm. um, having form time like everyone else, which is a chance to maybe socialize, yeah. you know, just calm yourself down, meet other people. Um, then what you'd have is, well, no, you're not going to do that. We're not going to let you socialize with your friends. You are now going to have an extra English lesson. For, so they come in first thing into immediate English or immediate maths. And if they're, if they're up for that, if they're happy to do that, brilliant. But for some of them, that was really punishing. Oh, sorry, here we go. Um, it's weak. Okay. Strong communication with school at the moment. Year 10, and it's 64%. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, that's, um, that's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Especially year 10, because it's that kind of, it's a bit of a moral dilemma, isn't it, at times mm -hmm. where you kind of, you know, the narrative is to force the you know, your young person to school because they've got to, because that's the, the requirement. But they're so distressed that it's almost, are they going to learn whilst they're there? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, we, we see this quite a lot. Um, and especially with ND, you know, ND does tend to have a more of a, their alert system regarding their anxiety is, is a lot more uh, sensitive, as it were. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a tricky one. I think it's trying to, I mean, hopefully you've got a school which is a, I mean, school are quite, um, what's the word, this is... I think they try, but they also, it doesn't, a school is a one fix fit all sometimes, isn't it? And I think 
it doesn't always work. Um, have you had support, or is there because there's there's there are third sector support, something like Snap Cymru. I don't know if you've heard of them. They advocate and support around attendance. Um, they're a free self referral um, service. I think there's a bit of a weight in this there, um, but, but they kind of advocate and kind of say right school what have you done to help support or almost you know put in a positive way because year 10 is a tricky one as well especially with the with the exams isn't it mm. and I get, with what I'm what I'm seeing there is you know she's in year 10 the tennis is important and I know the school will say 93 or 97 yeah it's high on, they want, which, yeah. Is, which is very high but her attendance is 64 which means more than half of the time that's she good. is making it in. Mm. And I know that this sounds like we're being patronizing, but that is a positive. She's not completely disengaged from school. You know, attendance of 64% suggests that she is trying, you know. Yeah, and that's certainly that you're trying as well. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose I always see it as a page, a, a book in, a, a, a page in the book of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, if the, the academia side is not um, the, the forefront, then it's just about you validating that, I suppose. I think that the other, I suppose I'm answering a question, I don't know, but the other answer, the problem we have is that, you know, attendance officers are quite, you know, strict at the minute, aren't they? Um, so that's why I, was, I suppose advocating Snap Cymru because they can see if the school have put measures in, um, you know, to, to help support you. Because I'm assuming, you know, we, we all try our best, don't we? And, you know, sometimes we can almost, um, inherit a sense of failure if our attendance isn't up with the high but which i disagree because 64 percent i think is great it's 64 percent time you've gone and, and and succeeded isn't it um so and, and if you see it as a, almost like a gradual thing as well if you're starting with 64 percent then chances are it can only go up um and it may be a case of you know being as encouraged as you can when she does attend and then try not to you know and I'm, I'm wondering, it, could, it, could it be the exam stressy? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, right, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, okay. Go out of it. Again, uh, so I mean, that, that's quite a, 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 bold statement. That's quite a bold statement, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. How, how do you grow out of attending school? <laughs> I'd love to see that measure, but... How do you grow out of stress? Could, could it be the fact that the, the exams are here, the stress levels are increasing, which is mm. then almost um, dropping the attendance. So it's a classic avoidance um, tool. You know, it's those type of um, questions which which could help. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So um, yeah, if you. Um, that, that might be helpful what um, Mel's put in there is if, because obviously, the, you know, each individual, we, you know, we could be here for ages, which, mm. you know, um, I suppose to get more value is if you was to link in with the school and say, look, we've attended the exam um, presentation through Shine. Could we organise to potentially speak to the practitioner? So if it's secondary school, it'll be myself in all the Ronda Taff areas um, and then there's obviously we've got team needs around um, Merthyr and Bridgend. Um, I'm just going off these two because they're year 10 and 11. Mm. And that might be a bit more helpful doing it in that um, in that process. Yeah, because then that would give you the chance to speak to the team leads, you know, in a bit more depth. Um, and they'd be able Yeah, because make... Shine is here for, you know, try to give the... Um, it's, it's a three-pronged approach, so it isn't just solely focusing on the young person. It is about supporting the parents and the staff because we're always quick to say that the child's not doing this, the child is wrong, the child, you know. But we know oh, from a holistic view, there's a lot more layers to it, um, which sometimes being being open to see that is great. Yeah, and without without a sense of blame at all. Yeah, just definitely. To see what all of us can be doing where we can. Um, to support you know, the child, and, and part of that is supporting parents, definitely. I don't know if that helps a little bit uh, mm -hmm. for those questions. It's just like I said, there's so much to kind of, I'm sure there's so much to speak about, but in a small measure of time, is um, I'd rather, you know, if you go to the school and say, right, could we have a, a chat with the practitioner? That'd be really helpful. And sorry about just to be, just to be uh, you know, clear, it's not that we're fogging you off, it's just that the policy is that all communication is done through the school. 
So you know, that's that's why we're saying please talk to your school and request the shine practitioners, not far off at all. Just, yeah, definitely. that's that's how the policy. That's how how you know we, we get meetings with yourselves. Oh, brilliant. Okay, good. That's good. Thank you. All no, right. that's really helpful. Yeah. yeah so. Anything we can try to help and just um, yeah, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Early intervention is key, and we know how, yes. how hard it is for parents, especially post COVID. It seems to be, you know, even more difficult. So, mm. I just think everyone just needs a little bit of a help or a little bit of a. Okay, you're doing a great job, um, yeah. and, and just that that understanding and support, really. Because mm. again, like we said, we the same things that we're talking about in terms of support to children. We really encourage it to apply it to yourselves as well. Mm. You know, when we're when when we're sort of catastroph maybe like that whole thing about catastrophizing. You know, what's the worst thing that happens if you fail your exam? What's the worst possible scenario? And and the kids will think through that. But also maybe for us as well as parents, like what is what is the worst case scenario that you're imagining? And then you know, again, yeah. have you know, really think about that and 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 sort of just to be to come to terms with what it is that you're worried about and what it is you want for your young person as well. So that helps you focus up on what we can do and what we can do to support the child and yourselves rather than, you know, maybe sort of, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, catastrophizing, I think all the possible things that could go wrong. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, well I, hope, I hope that helps. Like I said, it's a bit of a whistle uh, stop because it's a lot to compress in and mm -hmm. a lot to absorb. Like I said, we've got a number of resources, which we, you know, all the schools have got access to. So if you say to the school, can we have stuff? Um, from the Shine team, um, like anything, we, we've got extensive list. Too much to uh, to kind of um, to go through here now today, but um, mm. but we are there all uh, consistently. So, yeah, so um, I think this brings. On, if there aren't any other questions, um, I think we'll bring this to a close then in the next uh, minutes or so. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, again, feel free to sort of um, mention us to any um, other parents that you know might be struggling as well. Um, and you know, we're, we're always available for you know, rental training, to train, yeah. And the rest of it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. Well, take care and have a lovely Easter. Little, yeah, I forgot to see you. Yeah, we keep forgetting this Easter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I hope you're coping well with having people, <laughs> young people in the house. Ah, here we go. Okay. Yes. Really, yes. Early they help us. Yeah, that's yeah, pretend, we, really. Early help us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we do, we do signpost regularly to all the young yeah, people have different experiences. Um, you know, with that, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, as much help as possible. Definitely you know, get everyone involved. Don't, in don't, yeah, always ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. It's never, never enough help sometimes, you know. Yeah. 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 Goodbye. 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 That's better than my job, Shane. <laughs>